Welcome back to Mark Asks. This is one of my favorite segments because the people we've been getting through, the interviewees, have such unique and impressive insights on a whole range of different topics that I really feel like I learn just as much as you, the listener, by getting these people in. One of the very first people I got in was H.G. Tudor. He is the author of Knowing the Narcissist blog. He owns narcsite.com. You can find him on Instagram at Knowing the Narcissist. Knowing the Narcissist. And he's authored a whole bunch of books, including No Contact, How to Beat the Narcissist, Escape, How to Beat the Narcissist, Smeared, Knowing and Beating the Narcissist Campaign, and Sex and the Narcissist. He is a self-confessed greater elite narcissist, and his blog now has over 15 million views by empaths all around the world, where he spills the secrets of what it means to be a narcissist and how to break narcissistic trends in your relationships. Hey, she, thank you so much for coming back on the show today. I appreciate it. It's a pleasure, Mark. I'm delighted to be here and talking to you again. So in the last interview, HG, we covered a little bit of your background. We covered some of the myths around narcissism, the different types of narcissism, and we even explored into the early warning signs in that very first one or two dates. So the reason I got yeah. you back is I felt there was some awesome ground that we didn't get to cover in that one. So if you are listening okay. and want to hear about some of that stuff, head over to that first interview. I'll make sure the link is in the description. Today, what we're getting into is how to break narcissistic trends in your relationships, how to know if you're currently in a narcissistic relationship. And we even go into a little bit of a deeper insight about narcissists. So I've got some questions here from you, the subscribers, that you wanted to ask HG. And I even have one from my own interest, just to really explore the mind of a narcissist and how it works and how you can use that information to empower yourself. I did get a couple of comments on the past interview. Hey, this, this triggered me. This was hard to listen to. You know, if that's you, I'd, I'd really encourage you to stick with it. Because even though it can be hard to listen to, this is really empowering learning content that HG is sharing. And even if you have to small chunk it, just take five minutes or 10 minutes of a time, at a time, absorb it, take it in, and then come back. Because if you apply these lessons, you really can empower yourself a long, long way to not having these relationships in your life. So I've done most of the talking, HG, so it's time to get over to you. And we're going to jump straight into it today with your expertise. And this is, this is really your, your bread and butter straight into the signs and what women need to be looking for. In the last interview, we talked a little bit about the very early signs. So we talked about that first, second date. And what I want to address first is, can you tell the listeners some signs that a month in, maybe two months in, you know, that we're fewer, we're through that first little period. How does someone know? How does a woman know? that they can be heading down that path of a narcissist in a narcissistic relationship. Okay. Well, naturally, the ensnared with a narcissist will apply to all manner of different relationships, familial, social, business, societal. But we'll focus on the romantic one. Um, that's because that tends to be the one where people find out to the greatest extent that they have been ensnared by a narcissist and it invariably is the one which causes the greatest hurt and devastation to an individual. So, let's say uh, a woman or man is a couple of months into a new relationship with somebody, how might they determine that this individual is a narcissist? Well, the first thing to remember is that there are a wide range of what are described as red flags and potentially black flags that will give you indicators that this individual may well be a narcissist. And I use the word indicators because any one factor in itself does not mean that person is a narcissist. And therefore, I caution against people jumping to an early conclusion. Although there are many, many of our kind, and far more than people realize, one shouldn't race to the conclusion that because this individual repeatedly turns up late for dates, that means that he is a narcissist. It's indicative, it's not determinative. 
what you have to do is ensure that one, you know what these red flags are. And to that end, I direct people to read my book, Red Flags, because then some of those you'll read and go, oh yes, I'd heard about that one, or yeah, I kind of knew that one, but by a different name. But I guarantee there'll be many in there that you had no idea were indicators that this person is likely to be a narcissist. First thing is, educate yourself as to knowing the signs. It's a little bit similar to, um, what are, the, what are the signs that someone, for instance, might have meningitis? You look for a, a, a number of signs in aggregate to determine it, and then you go and get the expert opinion. You go to the hospital. So just because someone has a rash, that does not mean that they've got meningitis, but it may well mean that they have, and you look for other things. So similarly, one red flag doesn't mean this person's a narcissist. It's an indicator they could be. So be aware of looking for others but you need to know what to look for. So the book Red Flag will help you in that respect. The book Black Flag deals more with the abuse side of them. The so Red Flag talks about them in the seduction stage and Black Flag deals more with those when it's the abuse. But you need to know about all of those because if you don't know about them, how will you spot them? The second thing, before I move on to describing what some of these things are, is to remember that when you're an empathic individual and you're an empath, you are drawn to narcissists as we are drawn to you. And you have an innate addiction to our kind. And what that means is you suffer from what is called emotional thinking because emotional thinking is not your friend. What it wants you to do is engage with the narcissist and feed your addiction to the narcissist. And accordingly, your emotional thinking will obscure you to these red flags. Sometimes it will cause you to miss them. Often it will explain it away for you in a way that you think is not harmful. And so you have to guard against that emotional thinking. In one respect, it's listen to your gut. If it feels wrong, it seems wrong, don't let yourself explain it away. So let's, let's look at an example. One example is the classic of repeatedly texting somebody. If you are engaged with an individual and they are texting you hundreds of times a day, you know, 50 times a day, that is excessive and it is not healthy. It does not mean that person is a narcissist, but it means that there is a risk that they are a narcissist. And it's being done, one, because it's establishing a bond with you as we're seeking to control you. Two, it's being done to provoke in a nice way, a response from you. Because if we say, oh, you're my soulmate and you're wonderful. And you write back, oh, you're my soulmate too. I think you're absolutely wonderful. You're giving us a nice dollop of fuel. And as you know from previous discussions, Mark, fuel is the lifeblood to the narcissist. Also, when we are sending you lots and lots of messages, we are monopolizing you and we are keeping you to ourselves and away from other influences. So that kind of behavior is an indicator of a narcissist. Yes, you might get somebody who is not a narcissist who behaves that way. And there won't be any of the other factors that I will describe present. So if you don't see those other red flags, you read the book and you don't identify them, but this one person texts you a lot then they're probably narcissistic, but not a narcissist. And the spectrum is something I think we'll talk about later on with regard to where people sit in terms of uh, these behaviors. However, you should be aware, if someone's texting you a lot, be on your guard, because more likely than not, you're going to be dealing with a narcissist. Because somebody that's health, healthy and normal will text you a bit back and forth. There'll be a flurry, 10, 15 texts, for a few minutes and then it stops. Why? Because you get on with your life, they get on with their life. And you also both recognize boundary recognition. I am not going to keep texting this person because I'm intruding on their day and stopping them doing what they're doing. Yeah. I have empathy yeah. for that person. That means I recognize they're busy. I'm also busy myself. I don't feel the need to monopolize. So a healthy individual instinctively wouldn't do it. Whereas the narcissist having no boundary recognition instinctively regards it as our right to keep texting you. 
indeed, it becomes a necessity to exert that control. So that's uh, uh, an early example. So, for instance, if you're dealing with somebody who claims to have some kind of spiritual connection with you, so they trot out phrases such as, I'm an angel that's been sent to guard you, or the, the classic, you're my soulmate, or a sense a deep invisible bond between us that has brought us together. Oh, it sounds all wonderful and romantic. It sounds deliciously heaven sent. But that, that is a warning sign because it's, it's exhibiting the grandiosity of a narcissist. I've been sent from heaven. Got it. And you're explaining something really interesting that I, I've touched on with clients in a different context is almost, yeah. you know, if someone comes in and, and it just doesn't make sense, like it feels unhealthy, you're my son yeah. after a first week, as much as we want to dive into that fantasy, it's, it's not coming from a healthy place. And you're actually saying it can be coming right. that sort of stuff from a very narcissistic place. Absolutely right. Uh, again, um, Another, another uh, red flag is uh, being over complimentary or the compliment not being proportionate to the individual. So I'm sure many listeners will have found an occasion whereby they know that they're not bad looking, they know that they're in reasonable shape, and they know that they're pretty decent in the sack. But the narcissist will say, you're the most beautiful woman that I've ever met. You're better looking than uh, Sophia Vergara, for example, uh, Nicole Koopman. You're better looking than Heidi Klum. And you are absolutely sensational between the sheets. I've never had sex like this. It's monumental. And that person thinks, oh, it's really nice that they say all of these things. But honestly, I'm not all that. If you're thinking that, and it's nice to be complimented, everybody likes praise. But if you're thinking, hang on, this guy is going a bit overboard with this. Not only does it not match how I think about myself, but also it's over and over and over and over. Those are red flags, again, indicative, not determinative. Uh, again, someone may be just very polite. But what tends to happen is you might get somebody who, who is uh, complimentary quite a lot because they're well-mannered and polite, but it will at least match up to the situation. So they won't engage in this hyperbole of describing you as the most sexually proficient person in the continent. When you know yourself, you aren't really that good. And what's manifesting here is the infatuation that the narcissist has. When you are in that early golden period, when we're seducing you, we are infatuated. And that means that your great big hook nose is actually a really noble and endearing feature that you have. Everything we see about you is painted in this golden, this white light. You're the best thing since sliced bread. And it actually bears no resemblance to the reality. And of course, later on, when you're being devalued, your hook nose will be called that. You're a crone and you look like a witch. And you'll, of course, be thinking, hang on a second. Six months ago, you said I had a really noble nose. So if somebody's complimenting you and you feel that it is excessive compared to what you know about yourself, that is a red flag. Add to that, if the compliments are flowing thick and fast through the day and through the night, day after day after day, that's also a red flag. The occasional compliments here and there, that's fine. Compliments, you know, in the morning, oh, you, you're getting ready to go out, oh, you look absolutely beautiful. Then that, that's fine, that's healthy, because you've, you've dressed up, you've put some makeup on, and that's a nice compliment to receive. But if you're, you just staggered out of bed and your hair's all over the place, and you're being told that you look absolutely radiant and sensational, that doesn't really stack up. And if you're being complimented nearly on the hour, every hour, that's excessive and is part of the infatuation, the desire to provoke you to gain fuel, the control, etc. So there is another red flag. There's also the mirroring. If we like too many things that you like and we dislike too many things that you dislike, that's a red flag in itself. Of course, there are similarities between people. You both like cross-country skiing, for example. That's fine. But if you've met somebody and they seem to like absolutely everything that you like and they also dislike nearly everything you dislike, that's unnatural. That just does not happen. And what's occurring is the narcissist is mirroring you. It's 
For most narcissists, being lesser in mid-range, it's instinctive. The greater will do this in a calculated fashion, um, but for most narcissists, this is instinctive. And they cannot help but automatically go, oh yeah, I'm really into, uh, the, uh, into Shakespeare as well. Now, you can d drill down below that. Rather than take it at face value, you might say to the narcissist, oh really, which of his plays do you really like? Now, if you're dealing with a mid-range narcissist who's of some intelligence, they will probably be able to name a couple of works of Shakespeare. So they might come back at you and go, oh, well, Hamlet's my favorite. Yeah, yeah. Drill down the game with the narcissist, suspected narcissist. What is it about Hamlet that you like? Oh, well, I just think it's really well written. That's vague. Get some specifics. Why do you think it's well written? Engage in a bit of cross-examination here. You don't have to do it in a harsh way. It's well written. Now, if he comes back and says, well, I particularly like uh, the fact that uh, the, the, the soliloquies that Hamilton and his steady um, withdrawal from everybody around him as he severs all of his relationships with Ophelia, um, with his mother, with his stepfather, even with his, um, even with his friends, then that level of detail indicates you possibly are dealing with a greater who is that intelligent and is well read that can come up with that, or more likely, the person is genuine about liking Hamlet because they're giving yeah. you some detail. And, and most narcissists won't have that level of detail. And what you'll get is they will talk in broad terms, br wide brush strokes, and if you try and push them into the detail, they'll change the subject. And you'll get, so what is it you like about Hamlet then? And they'll put it back onto you. And this is where your emotional thinking will con you because you might think, well, traditionally, narcissists just like to talk about themselves, don't they? And he's now asking questions about me. That must mean, therefore, this guy is not a narcissist. Uh -uh. What, what he's doing is deflecting. His narcissism instinctively recognizes that you're pushing him into an area where he's going to be exposed. He's not thinking this, remember, because most narcissists operate through instinct. And a narcissism as a self-defense mechanism is saying to it, saying to the host, if you will, watch out, we rerun re re run the risk of being exposed in some way, deflect. And so the nice deflection is, you tell me about you. You tell me about why you like Hamlet. And then, and this is where it gets more perverse, the narcissist will hear what you say and will retain that information and then regurgitate it at a later stage to underpin why he liked Hamlet if the topic comes back at a later stage. So there's a bit of the dynamic for you as to how you can A, identify a narcissist and B, ask a few questions yourself. And I have on narcsite.com two articles, or you can go to YouTube and the videos are there, uh, which are tips to expose the narcissist. And there are 10 questions you can ask at an early juncture, which will help you expose uh, that you may well be dealing with a narcissist. Got it, got it. So <laughs> the sense I'm picking up is, and what we don't want the subscribers to do is just take all these signs, as you say, individually and think, oh, God, he, he texts a lot. Or, oh, God, he over complimented me. You've got to take everything together. And then the key sort of sense that I'm picking up, particularly from the texting, the compliments, is disproportions. Mm -hmm. So there's the, and, and it's not to say, hey, if I don't feel great about my body that I can't accept a body compliment but it's the extreme disproportionate compliments or disproportionate text, yeah. just the weird patterns in a greater context that you kind of add the pieces together. And that's how you'll know if the person is a narcissist. Yeah. And what, what you have to guard against is the fact that when the narcissist uh, pays you that compliment, we operate with, plausible conviction and plausible deniability. So we will say things which appear to have some semblance of foundation to them, some grain of truth. And what happens is you initially might think, oh, I'm not bad looking, but to say that I'm some kind of Helen of Troy, is a bit excessive. And there's your moment of warning. But what happens is your emotional thinking jumps in and says to you, he's just being nice. Roll with it. Learn to accept a compliment. Yeah, accept a compliment. And what happens you are beautiful. Yeah. Take this on. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And if you go back to the narcissist, 
up and say, well, that's very nice of you to say that, but come on, I am no Helen of Troy. What will the narcissist do? They will then use this convincing behavior and say to you, we will say, oh, but you are to me. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder and start trotting out some platitudes. What happens then? Your emotional thinking gets hold of it and thinks, sounds convincing, just accept the compliment. And most empathic people are self-flagellators. And so they'll go, oh, I'm not really good at accepting compliments. I know that about myself. So I need to learn to accept compliments. I need to learn that actually this guy's being nice. And you're also tricked because what may well have happened is your previous relationship was an awful one. Why? It was with a narcissist, but you haven't realized that. So you've been hurt by that douchebag. And when you now deal with your emotional thinking is saying, accept the compliment. Isn't it nice that he's being so delightful and loving towards you, particularly after that douchebag you had to deal with? Bang, you're conned again. Your emotional thinking has jumped in. When you pick up on this red flag, it's a red flag for a reason. It's warning you. Your emotional thinking is trying to take you away from seeing it and is trying to euphemize it, uh, dilute it. You must not let that happen. And how, how do you balance that? Do you not well, accept compliments? Do you, because it is a good thing to be a receiver of, of compliments. And it's something I talk about all the time. Yeah. How, how do you find a balance? Well, the, <clears throat> first of all, you can accept that compliment, but what you need to do is, in essence, you make a, a, a note, not a mental one, you write it down. And I offer a service called Date Defender, where I explain to you, when you're doing this dating, and you've, you've an awareness about narcissism, I can explain to you a technique that you can use. So that's why I can't go through it now. But there is a technique that you can use so that builds what I call logic defenses so that you actually spot red flags quicker and you listen to them and you act on them. So it enables you to apply, go so, get out and stay out. So, yeah, so I can, I can assist people with that. And what I also do is people describe the nature of a date, two or three dates, what happened, what was said, tell me more about that person and I'll analyze it for them. And I come back and basically, I mark it up with amber flags red flags and black flags. And then you can look at it. I'm objective and I'm dispassionate. I'm not in the relationship. So I can see it more clearly. What you've got to do is think to yourself, I have been burned by narcissists before. Therefore, I am attracted to them. They are attracted to me. There is a high risk that when I start dating, I will meet another narcissist. I don't say that to frighten people into never dating again. There are 7 billion people on this planet. Narcissists are still in the minority. You will find good, empathic, normal people. The problem is, most people have been burned by a narcissist. You keep drawing us to you, and you don't spot. The key to dating is not finding a good person. It's avoiding the wrong people. And when you learn to avoid us, you will automatically then find the good people that are there. And so what you can do is, you know that you are vulnerable to narcissists and anything that says to you, oh no, I know all about narcissism, I'll never get caught again, that's emotional thinking. Got it. If you recognize I'm at risk and it could happen again, then what you do is you read red flag, you read black flag and err on the side of caution. It is far better in your net of narcissism catching to dredge up the occasional non-narcissist by mistake, then don't apply a net at all and keep getting caught and caught again. Yeah, if you happen to reject somebody who wasn't a narcissist, it can happen, no biggie, there's plenty yeah. of other people out there. What's far worse is that you just don't try and you keep getting ensnared by narcissists. Because it does happen. No matter what you think you know about it, if you do not apply the knowledge, if you do not get your emotional thinking under control, you will get caught again. I've seen it happen. Um, so you, you can learn about these red flags and through Date Defender, I can assist people. And also I offer a narc detector consultation, which is hugely popular, where people answer a questionnaire 
and I tell them, are you with a narcissist or not? And if you are, what school and cadre they come from? So people understand what they're dealing with and then they can fashion their response appropriately and know what to expect. And that's hugely popular. And it's not the case. Everybody is a narcissist. There are plenty of people. I say, no, this person is not a narcissist. They might be narcissistic. So you can deal with that. But in terms of, this, in terms of uh, some of the signs, it's people claiming to have a spiritual connection. It's um, disproportionate compliments. It's being overcomplimentary. It's the monopolization of your time where we seek to isolate you. And isolation might be by monopolizing your time or actively cutting you out of the lives of other people by saying, oh, your friend Sandra, I think she's jealous of what we've got, you know. There is a subtle form of triangulation. The narcissist, is, the narcissist has instinctively recognized that Sandra is probably onto him. She might not know he's a narcissist, but she realizes there's something not right. Yeah, she's and so she's saying to the, the victim, this new guy, you want to be careful of him. It, it, the way that he always wants to spend time with you, the way that he over compliments you, it's, it's a bit creepy. It's a bit unhealthy. And she might know, or she might even say, I think this guy's a narcissist. And but so we will instinctively... Yeah, so the, so the narcissist recognizes these interfering factors, and we, we want to keep them away. So if you notice that the narcissist is monopolizing all of your time, either by spending lots of time with you, ringing you repeatedly during the day and talking for hours, Skyping you for very long periods of time, messaging you incessantly, that's monopolizing your time to keep other people out. And if the narcissist actually starts to say to you, oh, your dad doesn't like me. I think, you know, he's got a problem because you're daddy's little princess. What he's actually, the narcissist is actually doing is recognizing daddy is going to cause the narcissist the problem and he's smearing daddy at an early juncture to, to make the victim push dad away or the best friend or the colleague or the sister, whoever it is. So you notice that yeah. is we are bad mouthing, even if it's subtle, and sometimes it's a pity play. Oh, I don't think your dad likes me. And I've tried to be really nice with him, but I guess he's just overly protective. That doesn't sound like smearing, but it is. Watch, watch out for that happening. Also, a big one is the hated ex. If you meet somebody who starts saying, my ex was a complete bitch, she was a psycho, she was controlling, she never let me do anything. Ah. Yeah, that's a huge red flag. Yes, somebody can have had a horrible relationship. It happens. And you might meet an empath who was ensnared by a narcissist. But what, happen what happens is that comes out over time. People don't immediately launch in by saying, my ex was a nut job. They will say, it didn't work out. There were issues between us. And as you get to know one another, they let you in healthily and will say, yeah, well, actually, I learned that that person was a narcissist. I don't know if you know anything about narcissism, but it meant that they did this and they did this and they did this. And you might not find that out until a few months into the relationship because that person that has good boundary recognition, they don't have to control you by throwing all of these facts in there. They don't have to triangulate you by talking about the ex in this fashion. So it's genuine. Somebody comes along and, within, and, it can, and it happens at the first date. And of course, everybody, when they're dating, will go, you know, are you seeing anybody? Are you single? What happened in your last relationship? Have you ever been married? Yeah, yeah, I just got out of an absolutely horrendous relationship with this woman. She was a complete money boiler. Wouldn't leave me alone. In fact, I'll, I'll tell you now, because I really like you, watch out. She's probably watching us from outside of this restaurant. Woo, woo! There go the classics. That, you're, you're probably talking to a narcissist when somebody says that. Why? Because the narcissist it has painted that person black. Not grey. Black. Not, <laughs> not but black. And therefore, that person is the enemy. And everything they do is viewed as wrong, bad, they're hated. And the narcissistic perspective means that that, that person is viewed as Satan. Some of it will be based on truth because of the narcissist perspective. Some of it will be invented because of the narcissist perspective. But that wholesale denigration of that individual 
at an early stage and in such fulsome terms is a red flag. Also, this segues into another one, into, into an actual black flag, where the relationship is more established and you, and you might be finding yourself in devaluation. Yeah, so, yeah. I'm going to ask you about these in terms of relationships yeah. and black flags. You talk about red and black. You said there's a couple of videos on that. Um, yeah. What is it further along? Is it always black flags further? Or when a woman's yeah. in a relationship, um, you know, if she's been in there for years, how does yeah. it shift what she's seen? Okay. The narcissist has various people in his fuel matrix. Intimate partners, non-intimate partners, primary sources, secondary sources, tertiary sources. Very quickly, tertiary sources, strangers and acquaintances, secondary sources, colleagues, family, friend with benefits, mistress, booty call. Primary source, husband, wife, partner, cohab, boyfriend, girlfriend. Okay? Yep, got it. The most narcissists will have a primary source. In a keeping this within a romantic setting, if you're the intimate partner of a narcissist, you will either be a dirty little secret, you'll be an intimate partner secondary source of a shelf variety. So that's, the, that's, that's where you get a weekend with the narcissist, then you don't hear from him really for two weeks. You're picked up and you're put down, or you're the primary source, which means you have, on the face of it, the conventional relationship of you spend a lot of time together, you get married, you live together. Now, if you're the primary source, you will be devalued at some point. It could be after three months if you're really unlucky. It might be, more traditionally, it's anywhere between eight to 18 months. Sometimes it can be a bit longer. Right, so it's quite a little bit before you see the other Yeah, you might notice the occasional warning sign, but largely you're treated well. You're wonderful, you're the best thing since sliced bread, you're heaven sent, you're treated well, you're love bombed, you're bought lovely gifts, sex is fantastic, you're introduced to friends and family, you're described as being this absolutely wonderful and stunning person, everything's good. Sometimes it really is out there, absolutely gloriously wonderful it is. Other times it's just really nice, really pleasant and appears really loving. Mm -hmm. And other times, it's, it's good, nothing amazing, but it's good. And, but there's an absence of anything horrible, okay? Okay. Uh, then devaluation, as the sun always rises in the east, and we're all going to die at some point, devaluation will happen because this fuel becomes stale or you're not providing it often enough or you're not providing it in large enough quantities. You, we basically become bored with the primary source and thus you are devalued. We don't get rid of you then because we haven't got a replacement lined up. So we can't disrupt our fuel supply. So you are devalued to freshen it up. So by being horrible to you, you then react to us in a different way with negative fuel. You're hurt, you're angry, you're upset, you're frustrated. And that contrast freshens it up. It retains our interest in effect. Now, devaluation can be very subtle. There are the obvious examples, you start getting physically beaten up, but this is where you get the triangulation. And here's an example. Once upon a time, the ex was a psycho and a bunny boiler. Now, actually, she was more sexually adventurous than you, wife. And you're thinking, hang on a second, you told me that your ex was frigid. Wait, now you're saying she's more sexually adventurous than me. Okay, yep. triangulation. Yeah. Also, the facts aren't fitting with what's being said. That's a black flag, where the hated ex suddenly becomes praised. That is a black flag. You're being triangulated, and the narcissist is rewriting history. Why? The hitherto sp former spouse, the former IPPS, was painted black. They're now painted white. What they was once what was once bad is now seen as good. You as the current IPPS, the current spouse, what was once good about you when you were painted white, you're now painted black. So let's go back to what I mentioned earlier on in our discussion, Mark. That big nose of yours is, was once described as noble, you're painted white, you now look like a hag and a crone and a witch, you're painted black. What was once good is used against you. We are fluid, we are chameleons. So 
your flat where we once said, oh, isn't it cozy and compact and I feel safe here, when you're devalued, it's too small here, there isn't enough room to uh, swing a cat and the pressure on your shower is rubbish. Hang on a second, he never complained about this before. Yeah? yeah. And of course, what happened? You say, you never complained about this before, and you might say that with some consternation and possible hurt, you are issuing challenge fuel to the narcissist. Your hurt is emotion, so you're giving fuel, but you're challenging the narcissist because you're saying, hello, Mr. Narcissist, you're being inconsistent in what you said. You are rebelling against the narcissist's control. The narcissist must respond by putting down your rebellion. So we might do the very simple, which is the first line of narcissist defense, which is to say this, I never said that. You're not remembering. You're mistaken. Am I? Am I? And That's empaths right. do start to doubt themselves. Or we might be slightly more plausible and say, well, I said that back then, but I... I I thought it, but I didn't want to hurt your feelings. And that sounds plausible. But the reality is, back then, we genuinely thought, oh, sorry, we, 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 we really thought that your flat was cozy and safe and we really liked it. Why? Because it suited our purposes to tell you that. Now, it yeah. suited our, suits our purposes to say we don't like it. We will say and do whatever is necessary, even though it's inconsistent and contrarian to get what we want. So if the, if the hated ex suddenly becomes praised, that's a black flag. If you, suddenly find, if you suddenly find that the narcissist is not returning your calls with the speed that he once did, that the complimentary texts have dried up, you might think to yourself, well, hang on a second, that just happens in relationships, isn't it? They calm down, the honeymoon period has faded. They, again, that's your emotional thinking seeking to con you. If you've been dealing with somebody who gave you five months of incessant compliments and then it falls off a cliff, that's a narcissist at work. Got it. If that person, if that person is genuine and they just happen to give you lots of compliments, they will continue to do that all the way through the relationship. And there's nothing else that tells you that's a narcissist. That's just a person who is really polite and complimentary. But they will be consistent and they will keep it up. So if you've got somebody who is really complimentary, and there will be other factors around there that are red flags that tell you they're a narcissist, those compliments will then drop off the cliff. Or those compliments will turn into insults. I don't like your hair. What are you wearing that dress for? It makes you look fat. In a healthy relationship, you don't say that to somebody. You might be subtle and go, oh, I don't think that's quite your color. Or this dress might be a better fit for you. But you don't turn around to somebody that you apparently love and say, you look fat in that dress, or you look like a slut. It shows off the cellulite. You just don't, that's not a healthy response. But a narcissist will say those things. And the empath, because they're already ensnared, will then be thinking, oh, um, oh, I've, uh, I've put the wrong dress on then, haven't I? Rather than think, fuck you, how dare you say that to me? The empath goes, oh, I better go and change my dress because I want to please him. Because you're already ensnared and your emotional thinking has got hold of you. So in Black Flag, there are 50 of these flags that tell you that this person is a narcissist when you're in the devaluation stage. And if you're the primary source, you will find yourself there. So if the narcissist is triangulating you by talking about this really hot colleague that he's got, that she's a really brilliant addition to the team and that name keeps coming up and up and up, you're being triangulated and that's a narcissist. If the narcissist is insulting you verbally, sorry, if that person is insulting you verbally, you'll be dealing with a narcissist. A healthy person just doesn't do it. If you suddenly find that the narcissist is going missing and you can't get hold of him or her, that the calls aren't being returned, that the phone is being switched off, not only are you being given a silent treatment, and therefore devalued, that devaluation through the silent treatment is more likely we're with somebody else and your replacement is being cultivated. Got it. Those are just so do yeah. people go, how do you tell, I guess, if, if someone's going, wait, he's gone quiet, is it again, you have to take everything in the greater yeah, context, you know, read the Black Flags book, read the Red Flags book and sort of say, is this just one thing and this person is, is having some of their own emotional blocks He's struggling, yeah. whatever he's struggling with versus, oh shit, here's 
eight black flags I'm dating a narcissist? Is it, is it again a contextual thing? It's a contextual thing. You look at an aggregate, you can always come and consult with me and I will resolve it for you beyond any doubt through my expertise. But also, in a healthy relationship, if somebody is having some personal problems, let's say um, the lady's having some issues at work, she, uh, a couple of members of her team aren't around, she's got a heavy workload. She comes home, she's a little bit quiet, and the, uh, her partner will go, are you okay? You're a little bit quiet. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm just having quite a bit of problems at work. I'm just going to go and sit in the garden on my own for an hour. So if you just leave me be, and then I'll pop back over again. That's healthy. They will say why they're removing themselves. They will say why they're being quiet. They won't just disappear. Yeah. So if somebody disappears without explanation, that's an alarm bell in itself. A healthy person doesn't do it. They don't have to account for their every movement to you, but they will recognize because they've got empathy. I'm having problems. I need some space to myself. So I will explain that ahead of time to this person because I love them and I have empathy for how they feel. So work's a bit of a struggle at the minute. I don't really want to talk to anybody about it. I just want to sit on my own and gather my thoughts. It's a lovely day. I'm going to pour myself a glass of Chablis, sit in the garden for an hour. Can you just leave me be? And then I'll come in and we'll have a chat about things, about my day. Yeah, sure, you go and do that. Yeah, so and just that that is that communication is there. They're, just, they're doing behaviours that make healthy sense. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. That's right. So you, you, if you're uncertain, if you feel uncertain about the situation if you feel that it's putting you on edge and anxious listen to that that's your logic trying to warn you something's wrong it's not that you're the problem it's not that you're neurotic it's not for an excessive worrier your emotional thinking will try and take you down that route it's not that's logic saying to you there's a problem here listen to me listen to instincts me instincts kicking in being like this is and if you problem. have those doubts and you feel i can't quite work it out Consult with me. There is the date defender. Which date defender. Yeah, so you've got your date, date defender. defender. You've got your personal yeah. consult with you. And of course, That's right. which we'll touch on as well. Yeah, so, so date, date defender enables you to build logic defenses so you can go out into the world of dating and be less likely to be ensnared. It, oh, there's an alternative form of date defending where if you're already out there dating, I'll analyze what's been happening to tell you whether you've got amber, red, or black flags. So then you can make a decision to get out and stay out or proceed with caution or think, no, this is good. This is a healthy person I'm dealing with. Um, because it, at that early stage, you, you see narcissists everywhere. And usually you're right. Once you've become attuned to us, you will see lots more of us. But then what happens is your emotional thinking makes you doubt yourself and go, oh, I'm overcompensating here. And occasionally that can happen, but largely that's not the case. And then the other is the NARC detector service, where if you're in an established relationship, or whether it's romantic, familial, social, because I cover all spheres, there's a questionnaire, you answer it, and I will tell you, is this person a narcissist or not? And if they are, what school and casual they are, because that will help you uh, formulate your plan to escape and what you can expect to happen after that. Those, right. those so you've got the date defender, you've got the narc detector. Let's right. talk a little bit about getting out. You mentioned, you know, you yeah. can make that decision to get out if things go bad. If, if someone, yeah. you know, I've worked with a lot of women after the fact, uh, but it's only rarely yeah. that I get women come to me who are right in the midst of it. That, that's more unusual. Yeah. That happens occasionally, but I hear most yeah. of the post stories. What can, if a woman's listening to this and yeah. she's going, oh, I've checked the black flags, that's me, I've done checking the red flags, how does she, when she's yeah. in such a disempowered, ground down situation, um, where do you, how do you draw strength? Do you need a where, support network? What do you do? Okay. The first thing you do is when you realize that you've been ensnared by a narcissist, is you obey the first golden rule of freedom which is once you know, you go, you get out and you stay out. Okay. And you have to go no contact and it has to be total no contact. And the reason you go total no contact is one, it immediately removes you from the abusive, unpleasant, hurtful, downright soul destroying behavior that you're experiencing. Two, 
It gives you a period of time to gather your strength because you're going to need it. It, it allows you to prepare, to rebuild, just to draw breath even. Thirdly, it reduces your emotional thinking. And that part is absolutely crucial. When you're trying to escape from a narcissist, you are fighting two things. One, the narcissist, we want to keep hold of you. You are our possession. You belong to us. You are not going anywhere, thank you very much. So, if you are escaping us and you're putting a massive hole in our fuel matrix, we will fight through an initial grant hoover to keep you. Secondly, you're fighting against yourself. You are fighting your own addiction to us and your emotional thinking will be trying to make you stay with the narcissist. And it is crafty and it is conniving. And it will say things such as, you've got nowhere to live, so how can you leave him? What are you going to live on? He's the breadwinner. Well, he's not very well. Should you really be leaving him at this stage? His behavior might be the symptomatic of him being bipolar. How could you walk out on someone with a mental health problem? Yeah. Yeah. And it will come up with anything, anything that says to you, stay, Stand. and keep engaging with this person is emotional thinking and you must reject it. It's hard because often you've lost insight and you don't actually realize it's emotional thinking because the emotional thinking masquerades as logic. So for example, what it might do is say, okay, um, he's actually disengaged from me and he didn't tell me that the relationship's over. I need to go and sit down with him and go, why the hell is he treating me this way? What have I done wrong? And why is he now with her? That all sounds logical, doesn't it? Yeah. Get some answers. Yeah, you talk but about that's, And what's happened is your emotional thinking has got hold of your truth seeker trait and corrupted it to make you think it's logical to go and get answers from the narcissist. Don't do it. If somebody has ended a relationship with you without telling you and is immediately with someone else, that's a narcissist. Healthy people just don't do it. Don't go and get answers from them. Talk to me. Read my books. But don't go near that person ever again. And so your emotional thinking can do, does it in hundreds of different ways. Try and make you engage with the narcissist. And anything that is suggesting you should engage with the narcissist is emotional thinking. Obey that first golden rule of freedom. Get out. Stay out. Impose no contact. Read my book then read, which is no, no contact, read exorcism, which helps you then purge to reduce the triggers that will cause you to want to go back. It's hard and you won't, you won't succeed first time because your emotional thinking is too high. But the longer you stay away from the narcissist, you're draining your emotional thinking, which means you'll start to use logic more and more. And the beauty of it, Mark, is that alongside that, those feelings of anxiety or upset, you need to get answers, you need to make the pain go away. Those sensations will, over time, go because you're reducing your emotional thinking. But if you keep going back to the narcissist in some form, keep speaking on the phone, keep stalking the social media, hanging around where he lives, spending time with him, all you're doing is keeping your emotional thinking heightened. And with that, you'll keep your... Yes, the hurt will go away for a short period of time. It's like being a drug addict. Go cold turkey, it hurts. What's the easiest way to get rid of the pain of cold turkey? Take the drug again. Smoking in, yeah. But you're like a square one. So they have to go no contact. And that means you don't see the narcissist. You don't go anywhere near the narcissist. You stay away from the places that the narcissist frequents. You stay away from the places that the narcissist knows you go to. Change your routine for a period of time. Come off social media. Change your telephone number, change your email number, move house if necessary. And your emotional thinking will be throwing all these excuses in. Why should I move when I've done nothing wrong? Right. It's not fair. Right. Of course it's not fair, but this isn't about fairness. It's about doing what's right for you. How do you deal with it if, say, there's, uh, so you work together or there's kids involved? Right, okay. If you work together, the starting point is go and get another job. That's total no contact. It is, and, and, it's, and it's far more achievable than people think. Yes, there's a hassle involved in it, but balance it out. It's worth it. You can go and get a job somewhere else and escape this individual, or do, you want, or do you want to remain in a situation? And don't think that you can handle that narcissist because you can't, especially if you've been romantically involved, because the narcissist will keep hoovering you. 
if you are still in the same office as the narcissist, you're causing Hoover triggers and the narcissist will keep coming and nibbling at you and eventually your emotional thinking will rise and you'll get ensnared again. And anybody who says to me, oh no, that won't happen. I'm sorry, you're wrong. It does. It happens. I know it happens. Why? I've done it myself to people and I've seen it happen with the people I've consulted with. And what happens? They come back to me later and go, I wish I'd listened to you, HG. I said, you did listen. I said, what happened was your emotional thinking didn't apply it. And now you, you did apply what I've told you. You've got your emotional thinking under control. You moved jobs. And guess what? You've not heard from him, have you? No, that's because he's focused on somebody else now. And you're staying out of his spheres of influence. God, so first and foremost, you look to shift jobs. If you really can't do that, if your job is so unique and you're working, let's say, in Antarctica. Or, or the kids situation uh, is another one. Something, uh, well, something with, with, kids, with, with kids, starting point is you deny the narcissist access to those children. Right. If a court, that, that's what you do. Because that's, that's the right thing for you and it's the right thing for the children. That person's a narcissist. They're toxic. Now, of course, if a court has said you must have engagement with that individual, you must obey the court order. Okay, so that's what I call a legitimate exception to no contact. Legitimate exceptions are very few and far between. If there's no court order and you've agreed contact between yourselves, fair enough. And a narcissist can still be a good parent but to the children, but will still be horrible to the ex-spouse. And what you do in such circumstances is you arrange for the handover of the children through gatekeepers. You do it through third parties. Or if the children are old enough, you drop them at the garden gate and you watch them run, walk up the path and go in the house and you know that they've arrived safely. You do not have to stand there and talk to the narcissist. You do not have to be civil to the narcissist. People think, oh, well, at least it's good that we get on together in front of the kids. That is emotional thinking because it might be all pleasant for six months and then it will be used against you and you'll be left feeling angry. You'll be left feeling hurt. Don't go to that point. You don't need to be civil to the narcissist. It's that person's a narcissist. So find a way, what I'm hearing, find a way, however it is that you- Find a way, yeah. Communicate through email. If you have to have some communication, do it through email and tell the narcissist, I will only check this specific email address Wednesday at 6 p.m., Saturday at midday. If you send messages outside of that time, I will not receive them. I will only look in that the email inbox because then you are exerting control. If there's an emergency, say, you can ring this number and this person will contact me. Go through a third party. Again, sometimes the court tells you that you have to swap mobile numbers for purposes of emergencies. If that's the case, you've got to live with that until such time as you have evidence that it's been misused. You can then go back to court and say to the judge, I had to give him my number because of the court order, but here's evidence of him leaving me nasty messages, texting me horrible things. I don't want him to have my mobile number anymore. My proposal is that if there isn't, for the purpose of emergency, he, he can use my father's mobile number and my father will relay the message to me. That way, you're making it harder for the narcissist to engage with you. He's not getting fuel from you and your father can probably sort of filter out the shit. So if it's a shitty message, your father never tells you about it. And thus, yes. you are not reminded yes. about the narcissist and your emotional thinking isn't heightened. So, and again, through consultation, I can go into much more detail about this to help people with a bespoke solution to their situation. Do not think that you have to keep engaging with the narcissist. You don't. Your emotional thinking is trying to get you to do that. And what's the best way, hey, you <laughs> to have a chat to you how do they get in touch uh, you can email me at narcissist1909 at gmail.com so you can just write to me there and say this is my situation can you help and I'll say yes I can you now need to book a consultation or go to the menu bar at narc site n-a-r-c-s-i-t-e dot com and you'll see the range of options for consultation. So there's audio consultations of an hour or half an hour where you have the joy of talking to me directly as you are now. So you can ask me as many questions as you like and I'll give you lots of information uh, in a bespoke fashion. Or you can do an email consultation where you, if, if you don't want to talk to me, and I understand some people uh, might feel a little bit apprehensive about talking to me. Uh, I don't bite though and all the testimonials demonstrate how useful and professional it is 
put, you can send me the background, ask me four questions, and then I'll send you a sound file back answering everything for you. I do it as a sound file. One, it's faster for me. Two, I pack more information in for you rather than me writing back. Yeah. NARC detector, you set up, you answer the questionnaire. I give you a sound file analysis. Date defender, similar. So there's a range of consultations there. Hey, she, I have a question of my own yeah. that came up from the previous yeah. interview. You talked, we talked at the end, I said, can a narcissist love? And you gave me a very categoric answer. You said, a narcissist cannot love. Correct. And that, that really it paused me, first of all. And I know it paused a lot of the listeners. And then it got me thinking, you know, it's, mm -hmm. the way it was categorized, it was, it was very black and white. So it was almost yeah. like it's daytime or it's nighttime. You either are not with a narcissist and it's daytime or you're with a narcissist and it's nighttime. And my yeah. analytical brain went into this and said, well, there's always some gray areas in these things. Does it, I mean, is there like a threshold of mirror neurons where someone is suddenly, they, they cross some threshold and they go from being able to love to not being able to love? Or is there some sort of gray zone in between? Because self-interest is important uh, to some degree, not just in human, but in all the animal species. We all need a degree of self-interest. I, I don't know if that's a degree of narcissism or just a degree of natural self-selection. But yeah, how is, is there a black and white line between a narcissist and a non-narcissist or what's, what's the go there? Okay. Well, there are a few, a few things that come out of that. Uh, excellent question. The first is this. Human behavior is complex. It exists on a spectrum. You have people who fall within the empath group. You then have people who are empathic, but not empaths. You have normals. That's the vast majority of people on the planet. Normals have some narcissistic traits and some empathic traits. And you're absolutely right. Everybody has self-interest. You have to get through the world. Right. My cat has self-interest. Right, yeah. So everybody has self-interest. And that is a narcissistic trait. Everybody has narcissistic traits. Empathic people have them. Empaths have them. doesn't mean that they're bad. Narcissistic traits like pride can be used for good. If you are proud of how you look, you eat healthily and you exercise, that's good for you. But that doesn't hurt anybody else. But if you go to the gym to the exclusion of members of your family, so you are reneging on family responsibilities and obligations, that's the behavior of a narcissist because your self-interest strays into harm for other people, okay? Got it. And on the trip, you then have narcissistic people. So narcissistic people still have some empathy. So a, a, a quick example of that is pop star of sound check, perfectionist. Why? They're narcissistic. Narcissistic trait of pride, of jealousy, that they see another performer and they want to be better than that performer. They don't like being second best. And they tear a strip off the sound engineer and they say, you're an idiot. You're a fool. You're making me sound bad. You're fired. Get out of here. And then the tour manager says to the pop star, uh, we need this guy, uh, and you shouldn't really have spoken to him like that. Yeah, you're right, actually. You know what I'm like? I'm a perfectionist. This is a big tour. It's the biggest one I've done yet. There's a lot riding on it. I'll go and have a word with, with the sound engineer. And, and a narcissistic person goes to the sound engineer and goes, I shouldn't have spoken to you like that. I'm, I'm under a lot of pressure. Uh, I'm really sorry. Will you come back and help? Um, I shouldn't have spoken to you like that. It was wrong of me, unprofessional. I'm, I'm very sorry that I did. I had a temper tantrum in the moment. That's a narcissistic person. He's got empathy. His, narcissist, his narcissistic traits rose in the moment when he was getting cheesed off the sound check. So his empathy was diminished. But then when the narcissistic traits fall back, his empathy, even though it's low, returns. And he realizes what he did was wrong. He knows that was unpleasant. He goes and apologizes. The narcissist would do this. Has the tantrum, tour manager goes, you've got to get him back or, or, or this concert can't go ahead. Fuck him, he's an idiot. No, you, you, you need him. You shouldn't have spoken to him like that, that was wrong. I, I was right to speak to him like that. The man's a fool, he doesn't know what he's doing. Look, if you don't get him back, this tour doesn't go ahead. You'll lose, we'll get sued, you, you, your fans will go against you. I better go and speak to him. The narcissist only goes and speaks to that sound manager because 
he then recognizes he could lose out. He doesn't do it because he feels sorry. He will pretend to be sorry to get him back, but he's not. There's your distinction. And the major difference is the question of empathy. Narcissists have no empathy. We have cognitive fake empathy, if we're mid-range or greater. We have no emotional empathy. We do not instinctively feel bad, sorry, compassionate for other people. It's not there. So when you spoke about can you then love and then not love, that presupposes that person has loved at some point, has the capability to love. We don't have it at all. It's never there. And is that purely around empathy often comes from mirror neurons is that is that something that is is nature or nurtures is something that someone's born with or how does that um this small subset of the population not have this ability okay it is a combination of a genetic predisposition combined with an environmental factor which revolves around the lack of control and it's quite detailed and in order to avoid me going into one of my soliloquies what i suggest is to direct people if they go to youtube and listen to the video which is all about to to control is to cope the creation of a narcissist i explain there in crystal clear easy to understand detail what makes the narcissist and how it comes about wow. and that's a new video. I released it on Tuesday and it's received considerable acclaim from people already as to the insight behind it, how clear it is, and there's lots of eureka moments. And your listeners will really find that useful and enjoy listening to that. So to save my breath, to save your ears, to control is to cope, the creation of a narcissist, you'll find that video there. Uh, or if you just look at my video playlist, I think it's the, at the time of, Speaking to you, it's the second one. By the time this goes out, it might have moved down the list because there'll be other ones. Beautiful, beautiful. So, HG, one last quick tidbit. If, if a woman's in a relationship right now and she's worried she is with a narcissist, which book should she grab? There's a lot of your books. Which one would you direct her to if she's in the midst of a relationship right now? Really concerned. There are two, there are two she must go to. Red flag, black flag. Red flag, black flag, clear as that. Read those. Read those. The light bulbs will come on, and then you'll be able to move to my other books to help you get out of it. Or if you want that bespoke guidance and confirmation from the expert himself, consult with me. But red flag and black flag, those are the ones that people should go to. Beautiful, beautiful. There's there's some awesome action steps there HG has given you. Don't yeah. end up in these relationships. You know, you understand your worth. Don't close your eyes. Don't go into this emotional thinking that HG has been talking about. If you, if you get the red flags and you find they're not there, or if you get the black flags and find none of them are there, that's great. You're educated. Uh, if you do find they're there, then take that action. Whether you need to get a support network around you, message HG, uh, whether you just need to, to do it yourself, go no contact, whatever it is, take this action in your life because you and I both know it'll, it'll create the life that you really want in the future. Hey, Shee, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been an absolute pleasure. We've got some interesting questions that I have to save for you for next time you come on. It's always... Um... Indeed, indeed. I very much enjoyed speaking to you and thank you for listening as carefully as you always do. So I know uh, my blog readers will be looking forward to this. They had a lot of praise for the first interview that you did, Mark. So uh, I told them that we were speaking again. So they'll be looking out with eager anticipation for this next installment. Beautiful, beautiful. Thanks for joining me, HG. Remember, you can check out HG's site website at narcsite.com and as a little thing to end hg was actually chatting to me before the interview and he said if you want to know a little bit more about my personal life hg does have a girlfriend if you want to know more about the curiosity of the personal of hg's personal life and learn a bit about who's been speaking here you can head to at knowing the narcissist on instagram at knowing the narcissist and, and i'll be fascinated to look at that where we can just find a bit more about HG's own personal story behind this information that he gives. So thanks for listening today. Make sure you hit that big red subscribe button with the little bell so you get the next videos as well. Leave your comments, thoughts, future questions for HG. Put them all in the space below. Hope you got a lot out of today. HG, thank you so much for coming on board. My pleasure. Thanks, guys. We will see you soon.